This is Beth Sawin from Climate Interactive. In this short video, I'm going to walk you through some of the logic and some of the conversations we've been having in the Just Growth Circle as we explore the interaction between investment and sustainable infrastructure like green infrastructure and the impacts on um, displacement and the gentrification of neighborhoods. So our conversation started uh, looking at these stylistic graphs which show behavior of the system over time in this, this axis being time. So over time, there's increasing investment in a neighborhood, which increases amenities and infrastructure. And that tends to drive up property values and cost of living. If the earning potential of original residents can't keep up with that scale of rise, then there's a gap. And that gap between cost of living and earning potential of the neighborhood's original residents, that's what drives displacement. So there's two ways to limit displacement and limit that gap. One is to find ways to boost the speed at which the earning potential of the neighborhood's original residents rises. And the other is, at least for a percentage of the housing stock, to find ways to make sure that property values and cost of living don't rise any more quickly than the earning potential of the original residents. So in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the interacting feedback loops that set up this steep rise, and some of the interventions that have potential to limit the gap. So we started thinking about initial investments that increase the quality of infrastructure and amenities in a neighborhood. And all else being equal, as that increases, the relative attractiveness of the neighborhood increases. As that happens, property values in the neighborhood rise. And with increasing property values tends to be increasing influence in the neighborhood. And increasing influence has the power to attract even more investment. And we call this a reinforcing feedback loop marked with this R. Um, and that's because it's the type of change that feeds on itself. So the initial investment feeds back across the whole loop to cause even more investment. And you can imagine that kind of snowballing effect is what leads to the steep increase in property values and cost of living in a neighborhood. This can even be exacerbated uh, to a stronger extent if there's pressure on the system from outside of it. Uh, in a region like Atlanta, where people are tending to move there from other parts of the country, there's a second uh, force that's also increasing the relative attractiveness of neighborhoods, making this problem even trickier to solve. There's a second effect, and this one tends to limit um, the and eventually slow the growth in property values. And, and so that's shown here. As property values increase, average rent and property tax increase, and all else being equal, as a neighborhood gets more expensive, eventually that tends to decrease the relative attractiveness of the neighborhood. And that's a good time for me to explain also these little S's and O's. An S means a change in the same direction. So more investment leads to more infrastructure more infrastructure leads to more attractiveness. But more rent and property tax or higher rent and property tax has an opposite effect, that's this O, on the relative attractiveness of the neighborhood. So while this bottom feedback loop tends to drive property values up and up and up, this second feedback loop is the one that slows and eventually causes a plateau. And we call that balancing feedback. And so that's represented with a B. Here's some of the other effects that, are, that rise out of these two interacting feedback loops. One is that as the average rent and property tax increase, all else being equal, there's a higher risk of displacement. If the total number of affordable units can increase, that's going to mitigate that risk um, and tend to reduce it. The interplay between the different types of housing in a neighborhood is going to influence that amount of affordable units. And so we're showing three stocks of housing, high-end high, high end or expensive housing, affordable units, and units that are made permanently affordable. This would be through something like a land trust or some other legal mechanism. So as the amount of uh, affordable housing goes up through these interactions, um, the total amount of affordable units increases and the risk of displacement decreases. But there's a competing pressure on the housing stock, then that's caused by this relative attractiveness of the neighborhood. If that's rising, then there are pressures that tend to uh, want to increase the amount of new housing that's um, on the higher, higher, more expensive um, end, and even converting affordable units into high income units. Here's another impact. So if this part of the map is focused on housing and a way to reduce that gap 
that drives displacement via providing more affordable housing. The second way is to think about trying to boost the earning potential of residents in a neighborhood. And that makes some sense as the quality of infrastructure and amenities go up, you might expect there to be more jobs or higher paying jobs in the neighborhood. So there's more opportunities. With more opportunities, there's more opportunity for both um, higher income and also opportunities to raise uh, wealth. So income and wealth increase, and as those increase, all else being equal, the risk of displacement for people within the neighborhood would go down. These marks here represent a delay, and that's to say that often this interaction between new infrastructure, new opportunities, uh, higher income and, and wealth takes a little while. It takes job training and new jobs being developed, for instance, and so if the loops over on this side of the map are driving really fast. If property values are increasing really fast, it's challenging to have these feedback loops um, mitigate that risk of displacement uh, because they just tend to grow much more slowly. There's also an interaction between income and wealth. So as income goes up, people have more opportunity to increase their, their savings and their investments and their assets, and um, with more assets have more opportunity for higher income. One thing that we talked about a lot in our discussion, though, is that in some of the neighborhoods that are most at risk for displacement, particularly on this side of the map, um, th things may not play out easily um, the way that's pictured here. And so we added a little bit more to our map, which is to say that if a neighborhood is made up of a high, a high percentage people of color, there's a couple things that may not happen quite the way that the simple map implies. One is neighborhoods with more people of color may have a lot less political influence. And so these initial investments may not take off in the same way in neighborhoods that are high percentage people of color. The other really important um, dynamic that we talked about is the way in which these breadth, these new opportunities are not created equal for all people and all neighborhoods necessarily. And so based on um, educational trajectory and access to capital and all sorts of factors that we know are not um, equal opportunity factors, some of the, op some of the um, driving forces on these feedback loops on the right side of the map may be much weaker in neighborhoods that start out with a high percentage people of color. And in fact, the map um, may look really different. So we've used these dotted lines to show where the feedback loops are much weaker if a neighborhood has a high percentage people of color. And those are the kinds of reasons that um, one has to be very thoughtful about the investments in infrastructure um, and have input from members of the impacted communities to, who, who really are the ones best placed to say, you know, what are the potential of these feedback loops? What are the potential of some of the strategies here focused around affordable housing? So that's a quick introduction to the feedback loops and some, trying to capture some of the conversation that we've had in the Just Growth Circle so far. Thanks for listening.